Thank you for joining Jackson Lewis as we take a closer look at the employment law trends and tactics sure to shape 2023. This installment is one of 12 concise, field-specific podcast episodes that are part of our annual forecasting favorite, The Year Ahead. We invite you and others at your organization to experience the report's legislative, regulatory, and litigation insights in full at our website, jacksonlewis.com, or listen to the podcast series at whichever platform you turn to for compelling content. Glad to be here today. This is uh, Jeff Brecker, and I'm joined by Justin Barnes. We are the co-chairs of the Wage and Hour practice group here at Jackson Lewis. And uh, we'd like to cover a couple of things that employers can anticipate in 2023 with respect to wage and hour developments. And I think we're going to cover two primary topics today. The first is the anticipated um, rule from the Department of Labor relating to the salary level for uh, exempt employees. And then the second is the current proposed rule for independent contractor status under the FLSA. So kicking it off here, Justin, on the um, on the first topic, the salary level for exempt employees under the FLSA uh, is a hot topic. The DOL announced in 2021 that it was considering a new rulemaking to raise that salary level. Uh, This is for the executive, the administrative, and professional employees. A notice of proposed rulemaking was expected in April of 2022, but April of 2022 came and went and nothing happened. The DOL pushed it back to October of 2022, but that came and went, and we also did not have any proposed rule. And now the anticipated date of that Uh, Rule is going to be May of 2023 of this year, but of course that might be pushed back as well. The Department of Labor held some listening sessions uh, last year relating to the proposed rule, but the essence from what we can tell is that the DOL is interested in increasing the amount of the salary for the executive, administrative, and professional exemptions. Currently, that salary level is set at $35,568 uh, dollars for the standard uh, exemption and $107,432 for the highly compensated exemption. Those rates went into effect in January of 2020. And so you may recall that the Obama administration had proposed an even higher amount of 47000 $446, but that rule never made it out of the starting gate because there was a judge in Texas who held that rule was invalid and enjoined it. Um, so the the rule has been since 2020, 35,568. Uh, but the DOL is back at it again now that we have a new administration and they have indicated that they'd like to raise it. We, we don't know uh, what that amount is going to be, Uh, Some have advocated that the DOL increase it to very, very high rates, uh, over $80,000. Some Democrats wrote to the Secretary of Labor asking that it be increased to over $80,000. But um, at this point, we're still sort of in a wait and see pattern, a holding pattern. But if it is proposed, there will likely be, as the last time, some challenges. Probably the first challenge will be based on the major questions doctrine. So for those of you paying attention, uh, last year, the Supreme Court issued a a decision that basically resuscitated that uh, doctrine, the major questions doctrine, which, which holds that if there is a regulation that has a substantial impact on the economy, uh, an agency doesn't have the right to uh, regulate in that area unless there's been a clear statutory authorization from Congress. And in the OSHA rule in relating to COVID testing, the Supreme Court held that Congress had not clearly expressed that authorization to OSHA uh, and invalidated that rule. So we expect that this rule would probably be subject to the same type of challenge. And 
you know, the second probably challenge will be a very interesting argument that's actually currently pending in a case right now, which is whether or not the Department of Labor actually has the statutory authority to impose any salary level. So, Justin, we've been sort of under the assumption all these years that the Department of Labor has the right and has had the right to have a, a salary level as part of the exemption. There's been a salary level probably since 1938 or 1940. I think the first salary level was $12 a week uh, to be exempt. Uh, but some have challenged that uh, recently. There's a case pending in Texas right now, uh, a case brought against the Department of Labor by the Pacific or, or the attorneys of the Pacific Legal Foundation, where they're challenging the DOL's authority to even impose any salary level. So um, what's you know, the that, basis for that argument, Jeff? So it's, you know, it's a very interesting argument because, again, everyone has assumed for all these years that the um, DOL has the right to impose a salary level. But if you actually look at the statutory language of the Fair Labor Standards Act, it doesn't require any salary level to be exempt. What it says is that the exemption applies to any individual who is employed in the capacity of an executive, administrative, or professional. It doesn't say anything about a salary. So uh, the argument is that imposing a salary is inconsistent with the statutory language. And in fact, very interestingly, Justice Kavanaugh, during oral argument a few weeks ago in a case involving Helix, which is a, a case involving uh, uh, whether or not a particular employee was paid on a salary basis. Justice Kavanaugh questioned whether or not there really even is a basis in the statute to require a salary. Um, and I think that has probably caused some uh, some people at DOL to be a little bit uncomfortable. So, you know, we'll have to see how this pans out, but it definitely will have some challenges and the courts will have to decide ultimately whether the DOL even has the authority to impose a salary level uh, to begin with. Well, what do you think employers should be doing now, Jeff, to prepare for this anticipated overtime rule, which we don't even know really what it's going to be? So I would say sit tight. Just wait. There's really nothing that um, is imminent um, that you need to see what the what the rule is going to be. If it raises the salary level only um, minimally, then you may not need to take any action. If it's a very substantial increase, that may require you to either reclassify certain employees or increase the compensation Um for your existing employees to take advantage of the the exemption. Additionally, it's possible, uh, Justin, that they may not limit the rulemaking to a salary level. Uh, some have uh, questioned whether or not the DOL might also start tinkering with the duties requirements for the exemptions, um, particularly the administrative exemption. There may be some changes to those uh, to those exemptions. Uh, that we just have not um, anticipated yet. So uh, I think it's a wait and see uh, approach. The um, DOL, of course, has to first issue a notice of proposed rulemaking. And then once comments are received, they will uh, issue a final rule. I uh, would expect there would be a lot of comments. Last time the DOL increased the salary level, there were approximately, I think, 300,000 uh, comments. So uh, you know, there will be a lot of um, work for DOL to do. And my expectation is that if they are going to issue a, a final rule, that we probably will have it by the end of the year so that it's effective January 1st of 2024. That's just a prediction. Don't hold me to it. It could be uh, off base, but that 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 based on sort of prior uh, DOL activity, that's where I see that going. So sit tight. Uh, just um, wait for some updates and just know that it's on the uh, it's on the DOL's uh, agenda. Now, besides the, D the overtime rule, which is sort of a mystery at this point, there is no mystery as to what the DOL wants to do with respect to independent contractor status. So, uh, Justin, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about the existing uh, proposed rule. 
Yeah, speaking of tinkering, Jeff, the Department of Labor has been doing lots of tinkering as it relates to the uh, independent contractor rule. And if if any of you listeners are fans of soap operas like Jeff is, then <laughs> there's been a lot of drama with this independent contractor rule. A little bit of uh, a history lesson here. The Trump administration, the Department of Labor under the Trump administration, initially proposed a regulation that would have uh, clarified the independent contractor test under the FLSA. And it really didn't so much change the test. There's an economic realities test that courts and the Department of Labor have been uh, using for years to evaluate employee versus independent contractor classification. And it didn't so much change that test as focus on a particular couple of factors within the test. And the Trump administration proposed that rule, well, towards the end of the administration. Well, shortly after the Biden administration came in, they withdrew the Trump and independent contractor rule and indicated that they would be introducing a new rule. Well, then drama didn't stop there. A federal judge stepped in, a Texas federal court stepped in and held that the Biden administration's attempt to withdraw the rule was improper. So as it stands, the Trump independent contractor rule is still in effect. But towards the end of 2022, the Biden administration came back in and proposed a new rule that would officially withdraw the Trump independent contractor rule and impose a new rule. And again, the Biden proposed rule doesn't impose a new test. It, it applies the same economic realities test, but it, it removes the focus on particular core factors that, that was focused in the, in the Trump administration's rule. And it goes back to a holistic totality of the circumstances analysis of of all of the factors related to independent contractor status. Now, it's still just a proposed rule. The deadline for making comments has passed. That passed in December. And so at some point, we will get a final rule from the Department of Labor, uh, presumably sticking relatively close to the the rule that was proposed and in, in the notice of proposed rulemaking, which again focuses on six factors under the economic realities test, which really is not all that different from what uh, what courts and the DOL have been applying for years. What I find particularly interesting about the rule that was proposed by the Department of Labor is that it is not quite as extreme as some people were thinking may happen. There was speculation that the Department of Labor may try to impose what's called an ABC test as part of this new rulemaking. And the ABC test would have been a fundamental departure from decades of, of law as it relates to independent contractor classification. If you've been following the gig economy and independent contractor fights in the state of California, the ABC test will be familiar to you, but it, it is, without getting too into the weeds, it's a test that makes it much more difficult to prove independent contractor status. And so some people were surprised when this new proposed DOL rule did not go that far. I think it may have something to do with the fact that uh, President Biden's initial nominee for to head the Wage and Hour Division did not go through, and there's a different nominee now, but certainly this new proposed rule is not quite as extreme as, as some may have expected. I would expect a final rule to come out uh, in the not too distant future, probably sometime in the first quarter, but uh, you never really know. So Justin, would you say that the Trump rule made it easier to classify workers as independent contractors and that the Biden rule has made it more difficult? Broadly speaking, I would agree with that because under the Trump rule, 
you could focus on certain core factors and ignore others under the economic realities test. And the Biden independent contractor rule makes it harder to ignore certain factors under that test. That being said, Jeff, it is the it's pretty much the same factors and analysis that we've been dealing with for years. And I think that courts will likely still rely on a lot of their prior precedent on the uh, an analyzing the economic realities test, notwithstanding this flip flop under the under the test. Yeah. So one of the things that's interesting to me is that the Department of Labor in its um, notice of proposed rulemaking specifically states that um, these are guidelines that are being issued by the DOL and they are not intending it to be a regulation that's subject to Chevron deference, but instead just Skidmore deference, which is basically a court isn't required to uh, follow it. It can it can follow it based on how persuasive it is. And in light of the fact that there are already circuit court opinions in nearly every circuit addressing independent contractor status under the FLSA, um, I don't know how much weight any circuit court is going to give to the DOL's proposed rule because it seems to me they've already addressed the issue um, and the fact that the DOL is flip-flopped so many times in such a short period of time, I would say renders courts less likely to give it significant weight. Because if a DO, if the DOL takes a position that's a long-standing position that's been the same, you know, over six to seven administrations and over, you know, 60 years, and this is the way it's always been, courts are more likely to defer to the DOL on something like that. But here, when the DOL just changes its uh, approach, depending on which administration is in office, then I think, um, you know, the courts may be less likely to, to offer too much deference to it. So, yeah, I agree with that, Jeff. I, and I think that generally speaking, uh, the level of deference courts are going to provide to regulations just in general is going to be a subject of a, a lot of litigation in the future, given what we've seen in the recent past. So we hope that this has been helpful for all the listeners out there. Stay tuned for a lot more drama coming out of the DOL, and uh, we will keep everyone posted. Thank you for joining us for the Year Ahead 2023 Special Edition Podcast Series. Please tune in to the next episode, where we will continue to tell you not only what's legal, but what is effective. All of our Jackson Lewis podcasts are available to stream and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Libsyn, Pandora, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube. For more information on today's topic, our presenters, and other Jackson Lewis resources, visit jacksonlewis.com. As a reminder, this material is provided for informational purposes only. It is not intended to constitute legal advice nor does it create a client-lawyer relationship between Jackson Lewis and any recipient.